badass vegan John Lewis. Thank you so much for returning back to the Plant Trainers podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been a while. You know, what's funny. We probably would be around each other right now if it wasn't for everything that's going on. I just got a reminder on Facebook that said uh, I had just announced that I was going to like the Toronto Veg Fest like two, two years ago around this time. So there you go. Or Vegandale. Yeah, Vegandale. Uh, we normally see you August in Vegandale, the Toronto Veg Food Fest around the corner um, from when we're recording this, probably past already. But yeah, we normally see you a couple of times a year and it's been a boring year without you around. <laughs> Well, at least we get to see you now. So we see you here and our audience sees you too. And we're just lucky to have you back. Do you have, have no prob? Do you have a moment of gratitude to share with us and the listeners? Well, you know, my moment of gratitude, I, I immediately I did an interview for a magazine and they asked me like, you know, who do you think? And I was like, man, I, I honestly didn't get here on my own. I'm not one of those people. I do understand it takes you know, some person mentioning you in a conversation or a meeting with somebody. But I had to go back to my mom. Like, my mom just did so much for me as a kid. And that moment, my moment of gratitude is when she was in her 50s, going back to finish her degree. And I'm sitting in the hallway in college while she's finishing her degree. Like, that, I always look back at that, like, as a kid, I didn't think it was like a big thing, but as an adult, now I'm like, man, that had to be a lot for her. Working nine to five, and sometimes overtime, still coming home, picking me up from nursery school, taking me to college with her, sitting me down in the hallway, and, and telling me, "Don't you move?" <laughs> like you know, like, you know, because I really did. I just sat there the whole time while she was in class. I would go to the bathroom or something, but I sat there with my books, did my homework. But I look back on like the lessons that she was teaching me without saying a word right there. So that's my moment of gratitude is her like involving me. I mean, she kind of didn't have a choice either because we didn't have a babysitter, but it still was an involvement to me. I was like, yo, I'm in college right now. And I was only like seven or eight, but I felt like I was in college and that, that, that helped me out a lot. And before we started recording, we were talking about being at home, working from home, having our kids around, sitting on our lap, hanging off our shoulders, you know, as we work and trying to teach them the unspoken messages as well about entrepreneurship or following your heart or getting it done no matter what. So you're you're following exactly what she was teaching you at such a young age. Exactly. Yeah, like I say, my kids are, when people say, how do you do work-life balance? I'm like, there is no difference really at this point. Like my kids are sitting on my lap or, you know, if I'm editing something, they're sitting there watching them the movie, like there's a lot of music in the movie, like it's probably 98% music within the backdrop. So we got a whole score to it. And my kids are just dancing to the music the whole time I'm doing it. They're like, oh, I like that one, Poppy. Like, you know, so like they're involved in it and they don't even know they're involved in it. So that's kind of, it's, it's fun for me on that point. And and I guess having having a movie coming out, having a documentary coming out that's so focused on music I mean, that that gets a lot of people. I've been teaching a course and we were talking about yeah, just yesterday, you know, how music helps people with stress relief. Music helps people with exercise. Music is so big for people. It's a foundation. It, yeah, it, it really is. Yeah. It can, it, can, it can lead you down so many paths of different emotions that people don't even realize. Like if you're already mad, if you listen to the right, the right song, you could get even more pissed. Like, people don't even understand how, you know, the beating of the drum used to uh, encourage soldiers before they went to war. And I'm not talking about soldiers of today's age. I'm talking about, like, ancient warriors. Like, the power of the drum, the power of so many instruments. And it, it's still, to this day, it's the same thing. Like, it's so funny. I've been listening for the last week, and I'm not even exaggerating. I've been listening to Jeffrey Osborne, You Should Be Mine. Whether I'm in the gym, whether I'm just in the house, whether I'm in the car, for some reason, that song, it just hits all the emotions for me, like happiness, focus. Like I, I listen to all the different instruments in there and I see how much effort they put into this song. And this song is like early 80s. But for some reason, the song just hits now. So yeah, music, music can, it can really have power over your life and it can help you out in uh, so many ways. 
anyone that's used music in their training, whether they're training for an endurance race or just casually going for a walk, you could totally tell what the difference the music makes by looking at your heart rate when you're listening to the music. Because if you listen to something fast beat, you're going to notice that you're going to tend to push yourself harder and your heart rate's going to go up. Whereas if you're listening to something that's more mellow, it'll have the opposite effect. So it's very amazing how music is so in instrumental in our lives, but it makes such a big difference overall with everything that we are doing. Yeah, you probably see like an MMA fighter training to like Yanni or something. Like it's just like, you know, like it has those different ones. Now you might see them in a sauna relaxing, getting their mind together, might be Yanni. Like each music genre has this different effect on everybody. And I think it was Nike, not to promote Nike, but I think they used to have a uh, program in their shoes. Yep. And when you're yep. running, because I, I used to run half marathons. I don't know why, but I ran like eight of them. And then on the last one, I was just like, yeah, this is it. I'm over it. <laughs> but it had a program where it would tell you your heart rate during different songs. So it actually break it down to you. So you knew at this song, hey, you picked it up. And this song, you kind of kind of went down. And this song, you, you mellowed out a little bit more. So that's, it, it is true, like what you're saying about the music having a, an effect on different uh, heart rates. Those of you in our audience who are new to John, go back to episode 223 because that's when we talked about John's backstory and about self-empowerment. And it's a really great episode to introduce yourself to John Lewis, who we have here today. And we're not going to focus on your personal story so much, but we are going to focus more on some of the current events and the documentary that you're putting together right now because it's a very timely topic it's a very important topic and we need to shed some light on the injustice that's going on on our planet right now so why don't we just start off by can you give your definition of what injustice is and how you see it in the world right now injustice is twofold one i would say is the mistreatment of another being that's just what is injustice. And on the other fold is the inequality that comes with it. You know, I think sometimes people, when they hear about the inequality and they see what's going on, they think that black people, it, specific in this, they think that black people want other people to feel the pain. It's like, no, 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 we don't want the pain for anybody. I think that's what, I think a lot of people hear, they hear, uh, equality and they think revenge it's like no it's not revenge it's like no no one should be going through what you see nobody and i think that's where the confusion comes in and veganism is a lot like that for those people that associate with being vegan you know you want everybody to have a peaceful life you want everybody to thrive you want everybody to be happy you want harmony and not just people but animals and the land and the earth and and everything and when we are in a place where there is not justice for all humans i don't know how we can feel okay because we've created some kind of justice for animals we need to treat each other with just as much kindness as we do the other parts of of, of the world of the planet and by doing what you're doing with this documentary and by people speaking up and by everything going on on social right now, this is, this is bringing awareness is number one, because I think that there is a lot of ignorance in this world. Absolutely. But, you know, I also think that there's like, like we talked about, you know, if you're not exposed to something, I can't remember if we talked about it before or after right. we, we turned on the, but we were talking about, you know, if you're not exposed to ice, you're not going to learn how to skate. If you're not exposed to water, you're not going to learn how to swim. Um, if you haven't been exposed to injustice against with race, then you might not know until something big happens, like the types of things that been, have been happening in the world. Yeah, or I'm sorry, or you think it's a conspiracy or a scam that is not real because you haven't experienced it. it we see that a lot. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, growing up, a white Canadian Jew in a Jewish community in a Jewish school, I didn't see a lot of the injustice. I wasn't going, everybody who I went to school with looked like me. And 
we were dealing with we were dealing with other things we're dealing with swastikas on synagogues which doesn't doesn't necessarily equate at all but i was not exposed to it so all of these things that are coming out now um with black life matters and just thinking about being a parent and being scared for your child or your husband to leave the house um those are things that i was never exposed to before and I mean, we're going to get into we're going to get into food and, and, and food deserts and all of that. But just this whole idea of bringing more education to light so that people can digest it and then act accordingly. So so thank you for being here. And I really do look forward to to what we're going to to what we're going to talk about. Thank you again. I appreciate it. And, and just to go along with what you said, like, it's very interesting how people can be, you know, it's not, it's like the horse with the blinders on, which that is all, all the way wrong. We know that. But for an example, you know, sometimes because of the life that we had before this point, we have never seen some of the things that we've been conditioned to believe certain things. And I think that's another thing too, is breaking down the traditions that have been basically forced upon us. Um, most traditions are forced upon us and not all traditions are right. I think that's another thing. We think, you know, somebody say, well, traditionally, that's not what we do or that's not normal. Normal and tradition does not equal good or does not equal right. And I think that once we get over that hump, then we can kind of move forward. And I think also just to go along with what you're saying too, I, I, I believe that there is a, a, a form of white guilt that comes along with a lot of things. And I say this all the time. I don't want people to feel guilty. You're not guilty for what somebody else did. You're guilty if you continue on with that path of what happened before. So that's where that's where it's like, no, you didn't start the problem. But if you're not trying to help with the solution, guess what? Now you're part of the problem. Once you find out and you're like, no, nah, forget it. I don't even want to be a part of that. And you still involve yourself in the same actions that you know uh, are working against people, then you're then you are part of the problem at that point. So what what is the big problem right now that you see through your eyes? Because what you might see might be different than from what we see right now. So what is the big problem out there that you're seeing in society when it comes to injustice right now? It's such a huge jigsaw puzzle that's like the hardest that, i think that's the best way to explain it. like it's this thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and 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 the bad part is you don't have the picture to even put the puzzle together you know what i'm saying somebody's like here goes a thousand pieces and you're like well what am i supposed to make out of this puzzle like no no, no just put it together like so there's so many things that need to be done like i think one of the biggest things is that there has to be reform it does it has to be governmental reform but the problem with that is we can't wait on that either. There's things that we have to do as people, as citizens of the planet, as citizens of the, our countries. There's things that we have to do on our end because we can't wait another 100, 200 years because they don't even think they did anything wrong in the first place. So now you got to convince them that something was done wrong and then they got to make a change. So as a people, I think we have to stand up for each other. Um, I think as as... Black people have to stand up for themselves. I think white people do have to stand up for them. When you hear that racist joke, don't just put it under the table. Because that racist joke, if they thought it was funny to one person, they're like, well, you know what? I'll tell this again. And I'll tell it again. I'll tell it again. And nobody says you have to be angry. It's like, no, you know what, bro? That's not a good joke. You know, I think that I think it could be as subtle as that. I think that just bringing awareness to things. And it starts on that scale, but it, it gets bigger and bigger. There's a bigger scale of things, but... I think that's a real big thing is like if you see anything racist or in, you know, even hinting racism, you got to nip it in the bud right there and then it won't get so big. I mean, that uh, really, that's how we because racism will never leave. It'll always be here. But if the people that are racist understand that their actions have consequences, they'll stop just freelancing it and just going all over with it. They'll still be racist at home. Go, go for it. Do it at home. You be, you, cause you're gonna do it. But it wouldn't be so rampant. Like it, like you really see it. it. It's, it's, it's crazy. Like you said, through the eyes of a black person, looking at everything that's going on, it's very, very 
interesting how people one are in denial that it's even a system in place, and two, they think that black people are trying to play the victim. And they can look at all the footage, they can look at everything that's going on, and uh, it's funny. I had a meme that I'm going to put out, and I know it's going to get a lot of flack, but I'm used to it right now. And it basically says, it said, it, you know, when they say the conversation, so it says them, and then it says, um, but black people kill people all the kill each other all the time. And me saying, yeah, and soccer moms kill CEOs all the time. It's the same shit. But the media makes it seem like, well, black on black crime. They can't complain about a policeman that's supposed to be protecting them, that is paid to not harm them. They can't complain about that because a black person killed a black person. I'm like, yeah, but they don't tell you about white on white crime. It's a real thing. Black on black crime was literally made up by the media. You don't hear about white on white crime. Like, let's be honest, white people kill white people all the time. Indians kill Indians. You know, uh, no matter what race you want to go down the line, they kill each other because they're usually in the same area. So that's who they're going to, you know, mess up. But there's just so many steps. I I made a post today, um, and it talked about how in the uh, mid-1900s, they basically, there was this community, and they're just using this as one example, where they built 1,700 homes. They didn't have anybody to buy the homes yet, but they built these neighborhoods, 1,700 homes. What they did when they built those homes was they sold them for about $10,000. No black person could buy those homes. A black person couldn't even rent one of those homes. So what happened was you have this community of people, of white people that bought these houses, 1,700 homes now, this is just one small community, that they bought these houses for like 10000 Today, the equity in that is about 100000 So what did the white parents, what were they able to do with that money, with that equity? They could take their kids to college. They could pay for other things. While the black people, didn't ha- we didn't get equity. We couldn't buy land. So where was our equity going to come from? And that was just one systematic approach of the racism. And then, then you started going into all these different aspects, such as food and uh, schools and it's just so many things. So let's go into that food and let's talk a little bit about, I mean, we're, we're talking about the privilege to be able to invest, right? Like that's what happened with those homes. And I think that people are very quick to say everybody can eat better and everybody can eat a black, uh, everybody can eat a vegan diet. But at the same time, it's not accessible to everybody. Not everybody knows about it. And it really is a privilege. And I think now veganism is being looked at as a privilege for more hippie or, or more white. And there's a lot of racism happening in there. What, what where, where, where does that bring you? You know, it is funny because you, you see it many times where people are just like, well, everybody can be vegan. I'm like, yeah, everybody can. But there's education that comes with it, too. You have to learn and you have to be taught. And and sometimes it's being taught through an Instagram page or sometimes it's being taught where they actually go out and find the information themselves. It might be a TV program. But you're also combating against hundreds and hundreds of years of basically brainwashing that you need to eat these certain foods. So now, as nice as you may be, as factual as you may be, as good as your approach may be, you're dealing with centuries of conditioning that they have to break down. I know people literally in my community, in my family, that think they will die if they don't eat meat. They literally think they will break down and go into heart failure and all that, not even understanding that the number one cause of like heart disease is animal protein. Like, so it's, you gotta break that down. You gotta actually appeal to them in a manner that doesn't make them feel stupid, first of all. And I think that's one of the biggest things I see with with white vegans trying to tell black people how they, they need to be. If you tell somebody they're stupid, I don't care what you say after that. They don't, they're not listening to you anymore. Even if you say a 100% factual thing, once you spit in somebody's face, the conversation's over. And I, you see that so much. You People like, you're a piece of whatever, and then you should go vegan. It's too late. Like, whatever you said after that. So I think that's one of the biggest problems is that I do understand how people want to uh, speak more about, like, 
the inhumane things that are happening to animals. And I understand the anger. But that anger can't be put off on people that you're trying to help. If you're truly trying to help them, you can't be a jerk. You just can't be a jerk about it. You know, you can make some little funny puns in here and there, but you got to have a relationship for that first. You know, like when I make the funny memes or funny jokes, I have a relationship with my audience. I know what I'm doing and I'm still not calling anybody. I don't even go into like I'll use the word obesity, but not in a way to talk bad about somebody. Like I talk about the dangers of it, um, things like that, you know, and I, I think it'll get better. But I think we really have to touch base on our approach and our delivery. As much as, you know, because the, the message is only as important as, as the delivery as it is the actual subject matter. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting that you say it that way. I know that we get a ton of hate comments on social media all the time. I'm sure you get a whole boatload of those because you put out way more content. <laughs> Make like a dinner table or, book out of all the time. Yeah. Or, 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 our content's not even controversial in any way. No, you, but... You like to push the limit a little bit. <laughs> but I'll post on our TikTok a, a short video and we'll get all these blasts of comments from people that are saying things that just don't make much sense. And it's clear that they haven't looked at the science and the research and the information that is available, but yet they're telling me in the comments that, oh, I'm going to die tomorrow because I'm not getting my protein, or they're making comments that just are not really sensible. And sometimes I wonder how would be the right way for me to approach that response in a way that's going to get them to understand without me saying, well, you're just a moron. Well, some people aren't don't want to understand. Some people just want to pick a fight. Right. Some people haven't eaten enough fiber and they're so backed up that no matter what you say to them, they're going to react back to you anyway. Right. <laughs> you can bleep that out later but that's basically what they are <laughs> yeah it's, that's what it is but I, I think what I tell people when they ask me that question because I I don't really get the I get hate I do I do but I don't get the hate as far as like well you're vegan you're gonna die I I, I attest that to a goal of mine that I, I set in place when I first started Badass Vegan in 2010 I've been vegan 14 years, but I think when, when I wanted to make this impact is when I really said, you know what? I think I, myself, need to be the happiest, healthiest, most energetic person that they ever meet. At that point, their argument that they want to use, they can't use it against me. So they have to go to another page or they have to go somewhere else. But that's what I do. Like I, I, I When I'm in the gym, when I don't want to be in there, I get motivation from my haters. I really do. Like, I know people talk about it all the time. I'm like, no, no, no. I want them to hate. The more hate, now you're creating attention to the subject that I want. Oh, this stupid vegan over here. Somebody else that's their friend is going to go over there and be like, man, I, I really didn't see anything stupid that he was talking about. Like, I think he was actually, you know, talking some knowledge. And I think that's what we have to do. I, I think people have to be the example of what they're trying to portray. Because a lot of times people will send my page or, Tory Washington's page or Dom's page. They're like, look at these guys. And they're like, yo, those are mythical creatures online. Sometimes we gotta be the we gotta be the proof in front of our friends and family that we wanna we wanna change. You know what I'm saying? Cause I, I've seen it so many times. People are like, oh, he's on steroids. I'm like, you saw me in person, bro. I don't even look like I'm close to steroids. Like, if you put some lighting and a nice camera, yeah, I'm gonna look a little <laughs> bit of oil. Look. You know what I'm saying? I do work out. I've been working out forever. So, you know, like, I'm supposed to. And, I, and that's why I say also, like, there, when people are like, there's no way that you can be vegan and look that way, I'm like, well, it, with anything in life, if you study math every day, damn it, you better be good at math after 20 years of doing it. If you're good at, if you're working out 20 years in a row, you should look a certain way. You know, and that's what people don't think about. It's like, it, everything we do, if we do it in repetition, you're going to get better. And that leads to people that are scared to make the change. They don't want to. They don't want to mess up. They're scared to mess up. It's like no. The repetition is what's going to get you better. I, and I, I, I'm not a big promoter of this, but I know it happens. It's like I know people that went vegan. They were doing good. They went to a party. They slipped up. They had some meat. And then they're like, "Well, I'm done with vegan forever." It's like, no, no, no. You slipped up. Just come right back and just admit it. Just admit your fault. Like, man, I had this one party. I messed up. 
and that's it. Like, I, I see so many people, they're like, once you mess up, they're like done with life. It can't function anymore. It's like, no, you're going to mess up. How do you think you even started walking in the first place? You think you just, you were a baby one day and you just rolled over on your stomach, was like, did a push up, jumped up into a burpee, and you just start walking. It's not. <laughs> Like, I know some people think that way. Like, you know, I got to be perfect with everything. It's like, no, you got to be willing to start from scratch and be okay being the beginner before you're the expert. Everybody wants to be the expert. Yeah. But what about the access to the food in the first place? So when I watched the trailer for They're Trying to Kill Us, and tell me if I quoted this wrong, um, but I watched it three times to make sure. Um, 8% of African Americans live in communities without grocery stores. Is that what, is that what I got? So there are people who are relying on maybe convenience stores to buy canned goods, maybe some, and, and we talked about this with Char Nolan, like food deserts where you go in to buy a lemon and you're going to pay $3 for one lemon because the grocer has got to make some kind of 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 profit off it too and it's so hard to get into there so if you don't have access to fresh food if you don't have access to this information if you're working nine to five with three overtimes and you've got three kids at home and you're a single parent how do you make this better life this better health for yourself it's it it's crazy how there's just not access one, one of the biggest things that I'm working on personally with the film is coming up with a program that delivers more food to houses. Um, I'm like, look, we can deliver a whole air conditioner to a house in 24 hours. Why can't we get food to people? You know, like, so uh, I did talk to, like, the CEOs of uh, Whole Foods and um, trying to implement a, a, a program that gets food to people. Um, not saying that that's 100% going to happen, but working on that. But I think also what has to happen is we, and I'm not saying it's easy. Again, I think a lot of people say, what their argument to me when I try to give them like ways to reform everything is like, yeah, but that's not the easiest. I'm like, no, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it's possible. Until you use the word impossible, it can still be done. It just, it takes time. And, and the problem is people don't want to spend the time on it. So for instance, that $3 lemon it sucks to get that three dollar lemon, but in hindsight, how long, how many uses do you have for that lemon that you would have over buying a honey bun or buying, you know, like we have to start looking at ways to use everything. That's one thing with the book that I'm trying to put together right now is is meal prepping. I think that's a big step that a lot of people have missed because um, they think that man, I don't have time every day to cook. Yeah, you don't, but you have one day where you dedicate maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and now you've got all these different things and that you can eat throughout the week. I think uh, one of the biggest things too, when we're dealing with food access, is that we've been conditioned to believe that we need variety every day, every day. Your variety can come every other week. Your variety can come every two weeks. You're still getting that variety in your body. It doesn't have to be. If you grew up next to a mango tree before the industrialization of the world, what did you eat all day? You ate mangoes. But we've been conditioned like, oh, I can't eat the same thing every day. Meanwhile, while we're saying that, we're still ordering the same number five off of a dollar menu. And we're yeah. eating that every day. That's you know? true. But we're still eating the same thing every day. It, but it's conditioning again. We have to step back and understand that we are empowered. We are the ones that hold the power of our health. While these industries do want you to eat this junk and they do want you to be on these medications, they want you to have these surgeries that are you know, tens of thousands of dollars, they left the loophole. The loophole is you can still buy food that's healthy for you. But they made you believe that this other stuff is so cheap. And in reality, they don't talk about the subsidies that go into it. You know, and the money that's being poured into these industries to poison you. And so once we once we understand it, it's like, okay, that bodega, that corner store, that small mini mart, they're going to supply what the people buy. So that's when the buy. That's when people understand the power of the dollars. You have to step back and say, you know what? I see all that junk over there, and I see these four items over here in the corner that are vegetables. I'm not buying that other stuff. I'm buying the vegetables. What's going to happen? Just like you talked about earlier, the store's got to make a profit. 
if he sees the only way I'm making profit is by selling healthy food, guess what he's getting rid of? He's getting rid of the junk. Because he's about money. That doesn't mean he's going to be vegan or she's going to be vegan. It doesn't mean they're going to be vegan. It doesn't mean that they even care about your health. But they care about their bank account. And that's what it's all about. So money is basically why they say the root of all evil is the root of change. It definitely will change whatever these corrupt industries are doing. And if people don't think, I'm, I, if people don't think I have a lid in that, I always bring up here in America... The pharmaceutical industry here in North America, I'm sorry, in uh, in the USA, it is a 1.3 trillion dollar industry. The pharmaceutical industry, 1.3 trillion dollars. Now, I'm not saying medication is not needed. I'm not saying that the hospitals are not needed. But let's be honest about how many people are taking medications right now that basically, if they had a lifestyle change, they wouldn't need that medication anymore. Let's be honest about that. Now. With that being said, if 10% of the people that we're talking about, of these people that are part of that $1.3 trillion, if 10% of those people got healthy, the whole industry would implode. Implode. Because 10%, if you do the math, of $1.3 trillion is $130 billion. They don't want to see a healthy community. They don't want that. So we have to take it upon ourselves, like I said, we can't wait on them to do it. Now, mind you, the people that are these CEOs and these managers and all this, they didn't start the pharmaceutical, you know, foundation, but they don't want to change it either. You know, I know I, I got family members that are pharmaceutical reps, family members that are pharmaceutical reps. And they're like, yeah, man, this stuff is horrible. But they jump in their Mercedes every day and they go out and they sell it. So it's like, yeah, they know it's a problem, but hey, man, it pays. So it's up to us to change that. And and money is so powerful and you don't need a lot of money to create, to use that power. And that power doesn't have to be used in a negative way either. So I love what you're saying about, you know, if, if you could vote with $5 or vote with $500,000, it could be just as impactful. So we, we definitely need to be, you know... Um, I, I think I think what did we talk about? Is it that food stamps can't be used for fresh produce, um, and it could be used for cans? Do you know about that? There's a there's a lot of uh, stipulations that are all in there. Um, one of the things that when we were making while making the film, we talked to some people at a at a physicians community for responsible medicine, and they were breaking down the whole uh, food stamps. Well, now it's called a SNAP program. It used to be called food stamps. It's called SNAP program. And one of the things that's crazy is like you can't buy prepared foods with, uh, so like you've never seen anybody use food stamps, for instance, if you go into a grocery store and they have a deli section where they're making the sandwiches, they can't they can't buy the sandwich. Now they can make they can buy the things to make the sandwich, but they can't buy the sandwich. But what's funny is one of the biggest contributors to the SNAP program is first let's say Coca Cola. Now what is Coca Cola? Isn't that a prepared food? So it's so it's so political that we don't even see the backside or you know the Wizard of Oz to this whole scene, and that's what we need to get to is that okay if we start understanding that these programs they don't yeah they're there for you to use but you need to you need to find out all the guidelines of what you can buy and buy the good stuff and also if a SNAP program is to keep people healthy. They wouldn't allow you to buy the junk and the garbage and the things that are actually harming people. It would be only fresh produce, fresh, you know, rice, beans, legumes, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds. You know, if, that, if it's really to help the people, that's what it would be about. In the in the trailer, I saw somebody said that these industries are specifically targeting black people and trying to keep them sick. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I, I think the industries are specifically tar targeting people in general, not just black people, but maybe I'm wrong and maybe there's a difference in how the industries are targeting, but maybe if you could speak to, to that aspect, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, well, let's look at the, the main thing. So let's look at how they use marketing to target people. 
most of these fast food industries, the backdrop is usually hip hop based or sports based. What are usually the athletes they use? Black athletes. Mm. What is the music they use? They don't use rock music in McDonald's commercials. You listen to the beats. They don't listen. They don't. They don't have. Like I said, they don't have Yanni playing in the Burger King commercials. It's hip hop based. And then now, mind you, yes, white people are affected by, by that as well. But the white people that are not the one percent, the elite community, you're collateral damage to them. You know, like that's why I always tell people that, you know, like, oh man, this person's not a bad person. Like, okay, if you don't think that person's a bad person, you walk up to them and try to say hi. Most of these people that are in this elitist community, they don't want to, if you're not a part of that 1%, you can't even have a conversation with them. They don't want to talk to you. So that's what I want people to understand is that you look at that. Let's, we, one of, some of the research we did without giving away the movie, of course, is that, you know, look at Popeyes. They have a black lady sitting there on the screen talking about it's my recipe, this and that. Who's the CEO of the company? A white lady. But they make you think that this is this homegrown business that this black lady put together, you know, and it's, it's so crazy. And then you go down the line, it's the same thing, you know? Like, anybody, do the research on actual Colonel Sanders. You want to see racism? Go do the actual research on who Colonel Sanders actually is. You know, like, it's so crazy of... But when you mention that to a lot of people, they're like, no, nah, there's no way they would do this. Like, no, they they did it. The, and again, it's not the fault of the people that are in office right now, but the people that are in the office right now aren't trying to change it. So that's where the problem comes at. But getting back to what you said earlier about laughing at the racist joke just to not be confrontational and having to speak up are they not at fault for not trying to change it? Oh, yeah, they're at fault for not trying to change it, but they're not at fault for it. Like, I always tell people, like, when people talk about white guilt, what we talked about, like, you're not at fault for what your ancestors did. You're at fault for if you continue their traditions. That's what it is. So it's like, yeah, if you, if you hear a racist joke and you don't just say, hey, I don't think that's right, you're just as fault as the person that told you. You got to speak up. And that goes for anything. That's like, like... We are so conditioned in this world right now that black people are always claiming victim. And it goes across anything. Like it, when it comes to somebody saying something about rape, you got people that will deny them. Just, ah, man, I don't believe them. It's like, no, no, like you got you to gotta believe what's going on, especially when there's actual physical proof. Somebody will literally look at a clip of a police officer choking a person on the ground. I'm like, yeah, he was resisting the whole time. I'm like, how can you see resistance out of that, out of that whole time? Like, he might have been mad. You're getting fucking choked. <laughs> like, it's going to happen. You're losing your life. You're going to be mad. But he, nothing in his body struggled, strained, tried to get away. He, he was mad. And again, we have to get back to they still aren't supposed to kill somebody. If you found somebody robbing a house, police aren't still supposed to kill them. And I'm not saying people should be robbing houses. I'm not excusing that. But that's not the job of the police, is to kill somebody just because they didn't want to show them their license. Yeah. Or just because they didn't want to roll down the window. That's not, that has nothing to do with you shooting somebody. So at this point, where do we go from here? What can people do to start helping to implement some changes in their little bubble that they're living in or society in general so that we can make this a, po a more positive place, a more inclusive place, and a happier world for everybody? Yeah, I think it's support. I think everybody supports everybody. Like, I mean, we've known each other. It's so funny, probably five years now. Like, it's, it's funny how fast time goes, but it's always support. It's like... And I, and I don't think it has to be financial. I think for some reasons people see like, oh, well, I don't want to give them money, this and that. No, 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 it's support. So if you see something negative being said about a, a person of color, you speak up then. If you see something where they have a, a business opportunity, 
and you actually like the product. I'm not saying go buy everything that somebody sells just because they're black. No. I mean, if you actually like the product, buy it. Support it. You know, like when it comes to creatives and artists, a lot of times all these people are doing the stuff for free when, when the white person is actually getting paid to do the same exact advertisement, job, whatever. So I think it's just support. It's really support and making the change of not allowing racism to be around. If every white person that was on the fence about, should I say something, should I not say something, if they actually said something, you would see a major shift in everything. We just can't allow racism to exist in our communities. Like I said, everybody's not going to change. There's still going to be racist people at the end of the day. But if the racist people understand that there's consequences to their actions, they won't be so, you know, like I said, freelance to just display that racism to everybody. Like, I, no, I'm shunning here, I'm shunning there, yeah. I think that there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of different angles that it could be approached from. What I see with my own eyes within the white community is that people are uncomfortable using the word black. They don't know if they should say black or African American or person of color. If you're if if you see a group of five people and you know you you you'll very easily say the redhead or uh, or the Indian guy, but people will hesitate and not say the black guy. So if people can get comfortable knowing what vocabulary they can use, maybe then they can take some next steps going forward. So can you talk? to the white community who's uncomfortable and doesn't know what to say and maybe give us some guidance on how to make it a, a responsible and actionable and not feel like you're doing like you're being racist just by saying a word does that make sense and, yeah yeah and i believe it also comes down to what we talked about delivering the message what does your message contain that would make you feel uncomfortable about it if you're saying, I love black people, who's going to give you, you know, junk about that? Who's going to talk trash about that? But if you're saying in, in, a, in a derogatory manner or the actions of a black person in a derogatory manner, then sometimes you might want to, you know, like, well, that black person over there did this and, and, you know, how you put emphasis on black. I think if we take a step back and understand how we're presenting it, because I know a lot of people also are like, well, why is it OK to say black pride and you can't say white pride? You know, a lot of people don't understand the reasoning of using the word black. A lot of people don't understand that the reason, one of the major reasons that we use the word black is you can say Jewish pride. Nobody's going to give you junk about that. You can say Italian pride. Nobody's going to give you junk about that. German pride, as of black people, especially in, in the United States of America. Now, in Canada, I know it's a little different because a lot of people also know where they're from, their heritage. When it comes to us, they literally took our religion, they took our language, they took our education, they took our country, our tribe, our city. We don't know anything. So we can't be like Zimbabwe pride, Ghana pride, Ethiopian pride. We don't have that knowledge. So we have to use the word black. So when we say black pride or black power, it's not as if we're trying, hey, kill everybody else that's not black again. A lot of times people think, well, if they want to promote black power, they must mean kill all the other problems. Like, no, no, no. We just we're saying, understand that we deserve power too. We have power too. In all honesty, let's be honest. I think the world is very lucky that black people aren't vengeful. <laughs> like, if you really want to be honest, like I think the world is lucky that black people aren't vengeful. Because if it was, we we are some powerful people. But we always love. We always love everybody. We always show love. There's some anger there, of course. Why wouldn't there be anger? Look at what's been going on. Um, but as far as using the word, I really believe it's the intent. When you when you see people get flat for using the word black, it's never anybody saying, I love black people. Nobody's on there like, no black person is on there like, what do you mean you love black people? <laughs> That's not happening. So it's really the it's really the message that's using black people. If you're using black people in a positive manner, nobody I mean, you might get some people that don't like black people to give you some black. And I think that's also a big thing for people. You have to be okay 
with the wrong people not liking you. I think a lot of times, yeah. and that goes for life in general, a lot of times we are so worried about the opinion of people that don't want our best interest in the first place or somebody else's best interest. Like, we have to be okay with not being the favorite person in the room. I'm totally fine with that. If I know what I'm doing is right, you all know, yeah, I, 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 I have no problem not being the favorite person in the room. I'm okay with that. Because I can't sit around, like, my mom picked cotton as a kid. You know what I'm saying? Like, my mom picked cotton as a kid. If somebody was silent all that time, imagine where I would be right now. Hmm. So I, I look at that, like, I can't be silent about something. Now, mind you, she was at a time where she probably got two cents a day. She did get paid, but let's be honest, she was a kid, you know, out there picking cotton. So, you know, at, if there is injustice, feel free to speak up. It, you, and like I said, you don't always have to be angry, hateful, but you have to get the point across. Like a lot of my posts, if you notice, I'm not angry or hateful. I'm just making sure I get the point across. I want you to feel the impact of what I'm saying. But I'm never, I'm never like kill white people. I, you know, I've seen that. Don't get me wrong. I, I know there are some angry people out there. But again, it's kind of hard to blame them. But I'm trying to get them to understand like, no, not everybody's bad. But we do have to speak up. The documentary that's about to come out shortly, they're trying to kill us. Let's let our audience and viewers know what that's all about so that we could pump them up because I think it's going to be a very impactful documentary in a lot of ways. Thank you. Um, well, the movie is They're Trying to Kill Us. It's based off of uh, food injustice and social injustice through the lens of hip hop. Um, if anybody's seen What the Health, it's actually the follow up film to What the Health. My co director, Keegan Kuhn, um, we got together four years ago. We've actually been filming this for four years. I can't believe it's been this long. Um, and so when people are like, oh, you just put this together because of what's going on? Like, no, we saw this a long time ago. We talked about pandemics in the film from the beginning, police brutality, racial injustice, food inequality. You know, you really get to see food inequality, especially with what's going on, you know, like during these COVID experiences, you know, the access to food, uh, things like that. And so the movie just touches base on how important our health is mentally and physically. Uh, because I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, when you're unhealthy, that's another added level of stress that is doing a toll on your body. So now you're unhealthy physically and mentally, you're releasing hormones into your body that's actually negative as well. So it's a lot of things you touch base on. We talk, like I said, the systematic racism, but we also, one of the biggest things I wanted to do when I, you know, when Keegan and I started this, we wanted to be solution based. I think one of the biggest problems with a lot of documentaries is that they'll show you the problem and then right at the end, we think they got about to tell you a solution, they roll credits. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay, so it's, this is horrible. So life is horrible. The world's about to end. We'll talk to you later. We don't tell you how to, you know, heal the world. So that was one of my biggest things is being solution based, showing people about, you know, how we can eat better, our vegan lifestyle, stuff like that, um, and, and showing actual scientific data and stuff like that. So that's a big thing. That's one of the big, <laughs> come on. I, I, got a little, I got a little friend. Bring, bring him in. That's awesome. It's my little mini me. Why are you so wet? What happened? You spilled like a whole bunch of water on you. Hey. Hey, kitty. Hi. Oh, you're brushing your teeth? Brush your teeth? Awesome. Good job. I'm <laughs> You're Mars. That's Mars. Hey, Mars. You? Yeah, okay. That works. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you? I'm, I'm this old. Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. That's, you know, to really, really be solution-based. And that one of the solutions as far as, like, empowering people to understand that they can take their health back into their hands. And another big one is, you know, trying to get pro a program together or programs together to get food to people. I think that's, that's, that's important too. You know, like I, I know this documentary has a lot of power to it and I want to make sure I use that power to actually impact change and not just like, Hey, I got this documentary out. Here you go. Um, so that's one of the biggest things. 
that's, that's Nigelino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for people that want to learn more about the film and when it's going to be released and more about you, where would be the best places for them to go? Um, if you go to badassvegan.com, uh, you can go there. You can also go to they're trying to kill us.com. Um, you can sign up for the email list. They will be, you know, giving updates and, uh, more about the actual release date right now because we're still finishing we have about four to five more interviews we need to do and of course you know with everything going on you know you, you can't just be like hey i'll be over there next week and we're going to do an interview like now there's a lot of things going on uh for instance one person that we're trying to interview what well, we are interviewing it they were in a bubble filming a show they had to get done with that bubble then they had to go back home to la so it means that i got to go to la to film them, I got to go in my own little bubble to make sure everything's okay. And so there's so many things. And and people are like, well, why don't you just do, you know, like online? I was like, well, we're, we've been using this anamorphic camera for the whole show, and it just won't look, it just won't match. So that's another big thing. You getting down, buddy? Okay, say bye-bye. Bye. bye. See ya. <laughs> See ya. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's yeah. real life, real life here. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. You don't want to put it in there. You won't get it out. <laughs> so we're, we're super excited to see it and can't wait to help you promote it. We do hope that everybody goes to they're trying to kill us dot com or badassvegan dot com to sign up for that newsletter so that they do get more information on when it's coming out. Of course, you know, being stalled by by the pandemic is unfortunate. But once it's there, it's just it's day one, no matter what. So it will move forward and it will make the impact. And we're, we're so happy for you and what you're doing. Thank you. I, and I think actually as, as bad as it sounds, I think the actual current events brought more awareness to the film. Yeah. It, it really did. Like, I don't, I don't think if we would have finished it in two years and tried to come out, it would have had the same impact as it does now. I'm looking forward to seeing it. It's always great to spend time with you, John, and hopefully next time it'll be in person at yeah. another Veg Fest or Vegandale or whatever it may be. But uh, we right. always love hanging out. So thank you so much again for being on the Plant Trainers Podcast. Thank you for the invite again. Much love.